I can get used to this. Me too. Experience more with $100 credit at hundreds of hotels from Chase Sapphire Reserve. Chase, make more of what's yours. I'm Matt Brennan. I'm Deputy Entertainment and Arts Editor at the Los Angeles Times. Thank you for being here this morning. Um, I would love to, to uh, have a huge round of applause for the team behind Flora and Son. Oh, my movie. Oh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Um, okay, so I'm going to start off with a slightly lighthearted question. One of my favorite lines in the movie is, I'll pick you up at the airport, which in Los Angeles is a great profession of love. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering if uh, the Irish on the panel could talk about what the Irish equivalent of that is. What is the sort of like strange thing that you would offer to do some for someone that is like a great profession of love? That is such a good question. I definitely picked a lot of people up from the airport in the days before, uh, you know, when, we, when I was young. It was, you're right, it was dead. That's so true. It was either your family who you loved or somebody that you wanted to impress. You picked <laughs> them up. But now it's just a bit creepy to say I'll pick you up at the airport. It's like, it's fine. I can get my own transport. I'm not 12. <laughs> yeah, I haven't been picked up at the airport like ever. <laughs> From any family member Aww. that I... <laughs> um, I don't know. My brother picked me up from Jack and his girlfriend's house one morning after a wild night of drinking. And it was it's like an hour. Way. It's a, it's a long drive. That was a good profession of love. Picking someone up who's hung over. I was like, you're a good brother, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been picked up from school. Does that count? I mean, that's a major profession of love. Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. Thanks, Dad, for picking me up from school all those many long, <laughs> draining <laughs> days. Especially since it's daily. That's commitment. Very committed man. <laughs> um, so, John, I would love to hear you talk about how the idea for Flora and Son came about. So it was an idea that was knocking around in my head for a little bit um, before the whole pandemic thing. And then, like every other writer, I was sitting at home every morning trying to imagine how we'd all get out of this and what people would want to see when we get out of it. And you'd speak to your friends and co-writers and producers, and we were trying to figure out what are we all going to go, you know, when cinemas reopen and theatres reopen and we can go and see gigs, what do we want to see? And uh, everybody was hypothesizing about what it's going to be. Are we going to want to see huge action movies that take us out of where we've all been collectively for the last couple of years? And that was the, we suspected that that would be what would happen. But I sort of put my money on something else, which is, I feel, and I'm not sure yet, so I could be wrong, that what has happened is that we want to feel a little bit less bad about ourselves as individuals. That the pandemic locked us in these houses and we read these terrible stories and we looked in the mirror and felt a bit shit about ourselves and had to look at ourselves in a new way. And I, this film is definitely about uh, a troubled character who is a bit shit sometimes <laughs> and he has a kid and battles with the kid. and. And that it's, I think the message of the movie is that it's okay to be a bit shit sometimes. And it's helpful to hear films tell that story or plays or read articles that, that sort of say it's okay to be not a perfect human being and to be flawed as long as you can love somebody or be loved. And so I wrote this very, very small kind of four-hander movie. And I, there's nothing in it. It's two people talking on Zoom. There's a little bit of music. It's a very tiny, tiny, tiny story. And... Uh, that was my feeling that people will want to come back out of this and go and see details, not big pictures. But I could be wrong, I don't know. But that was my kind of... We're about to find out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that was kind of the background for it. Since you bring up the pandemic and the use of Zoom, I'm curious, you know, what, what made you think that that was an interesting way to have these characters connect? Was that inspired by... How much we've relied on video conferencing since the pandemic started, or was that? I know that's not the rationale for it in the film, but right. it did seem reminiscent yeah. of some of those connections that we had to make, especially in the yes. early months of yeah. the pandemic. It could the, the film could only be made after all of that. I hate Zoom and I hate <laughs> virtual relations and 
my son is FaceTiming me now, and it's, I'd just rather speak to him. I'm an old guy, I'm used to the ear and not the face and all of that. But it's a film that certainly couldn't have been made without all of us having that new piece of technology in our life. Um, but I, I actually, the reason that I did it as a Zoom thing was that I found the discipline of that to be interesting. And I thought it would be interesting to see if I could tell a love story through a virtual, like people who never meet. They never meet in the film. And that was an interesting challenge as a writer to try and stick to those rules uh, uh, and see if I could tell a love story with these screens in the way. And you'll be the judge of whether that's been successful or not. I have no idea. But, uh, but uh, it's an interesting. It could only be made, I think, after we all got used to that weird form of technology, though, I think. Eve and Joseph, what were the... First of all, how practically did you do it? Were you actually separated or were you together and pretending to be separated? And what were the particular challenges of playing people who are connecting in that fashion instead of in real life? Um, well, we were on the same set, but he was next door and it was live. So we had to wear these earpieces that I hated. <laughs> so you could hear the other person and then also act as if you're on the computer. And I don't know if we really like thought it was going to be hard until we got there. And then we were like, wait, this is really hard. <laughs> you know, because so much about building chemistry is being in person in the room with that actor. And it is more challenging when you have the voice in your ear and you know you are got to do this, that, and the other in the, in, the sh in the scene. And then also trying to just develop that um, kind of chemistry was a bit challenging at the beginning, I think. Well, and also, I think it's, it's a testament to the cool filmmaking device that you came up with, John, to sometimes have us be separate and then sometimes use the magic of cinema to bring us into the same room so that we could have that kind of chemistry you're talking about. Because, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to do when you're... It's hard to have chemistry when you're not, <laughs> you're not in the same place. But I guess that's the challenge you're talking about that we're all facing, is, like, how to be human in this increasingly digital world. And I think there's a lot to be pessimistic about, frankly, the way that technology is impacting, you know, us and our culture. So I found it nice to show technology actually having a nice positive moment and showing this connection between these two people that wouldn't have been possible without that technology of, uh, of you know, a a young mom in Ireland taking guitar lessons from this, you know, kind of music snob in, in <laughs> California. Like, these are two people that never would have met if not for the internet. So, so it is, I think, like, I, I share the world's pessimism about the way technology is going, but it's nice to remember there are some positive moments as well. And I think that's also why the rooftop thing, the rooftop yeah. scene feels so romantic because they're both side by side for the first time, right. you know? And that, then that leads into your favorite line. I'll pick you up at the airport. <laughs> I told you it was a profession of love. <laughs> um, it also, I mean, it makes sense that the building of the chemistry is a challenge because that suits the film's arc authentically. Their first interaction goes poorly, thanks to Flora being thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> She's thirsty. <laughs> um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about the music uh, I would love just for each of you to sort of go down the line and talk about what you learned musically from this film, because I'm assuming you each kind of came to it with a different level of comfort with what you had to perform, and also the plot of the movie is very much about developing more comfort with what you have to perform. Jack, you want to start us off? I learned how to play that track at the end of the film in 20 minutes. <laughs> Jack could be a mean bass player. Yeah, <laughs> that was pretty wild. Came in, hadn't heard the track, and it was like, okay, I guess we're gonna do this. And uh, Rob gave me some cans, and John just like showed me how to play the track, and I was panicking, panicking trying. There's also a bit of slap bass in it. I used to be a slap bass player. Yeah, when it was the least cool thing in the world. <laughs> so I was teaching Jack some of the. And he actually, you you should totally be a bass player. Uh, what can I say? So yeah, I learned to play the track in 20 minutes. Yeah, I mean, the funny thing about this movie was I was m I grew up playing the guitar and the drums and the piano and all that stuff. But I'd never sang before, and I didn't ever want to sing before, but I was like, oh, fuck, okay, I'll do it. Um, so I was nervous about that, but we 
really didn't have any songs <laughs> by the time that we started shooting. And so I was freaking out going, I'm going to have to practice. <laughs> but we didn't have them. So on the weekend, we would go to the studio. And then it was the first time I met Joe. And us and Gary Clark, our music director, just sat in a room and we wrote a song within eight hours and then recorded it. So it was like, you know, terrifying, but also one of the best experiences I think I've had because we felt so involved and we felt like we were really speaking through our characters and there was no time to shit your pants, which was nice. <laughs> um, well, I had to learn how to sing, which uh, I don't think I did learn. And I, I, wouldn't, I haven't seen it, so I don't know. But um, yeah, I, I worked with Gary Clark, uh, learning how to sing, and Evie Burnett. Uh, my singing coach, and I had to learn how to sing for three weeks, and I had to learn how to play garage band and stuff, which is the first time I met Eve, which was um, how my song is played. We played it, I think it's entire through entirely through garage band, is it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, so I had to learn how to play the track and stuff and press play and learn all the buttons and get it working on the day. You had a particular challenge, too, because the singing that you do is rapping, and <laughs> that's sort of a different skill. I mean, what was your... What was your thought when that was the challenge that was presented to you? And how did you go about learning how to do it? Because I would totally believe that you had been doing it for ages based <laughs> on the film. Um, well, first I was told I was going to be singing a lot of the time and I was very nervous about that. But then I was told I'd be rapping and I was a bit more comfortable with that because I think uh, definitely around my age demographic, I think my friends wouldn't slag me as much for rapping <laughs> as they would for <laughs> giving out a good sing song. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I had to learn how to rap, and uh, I didn't find it too difficult to rap. But then again, it could turn out awful, and I could be the worst rapper that anyone's ever seen in this room. <laughs> um, but no, I really enjoyed learning how to rap, and like learn the tempo, and the, like kind of the pace to say things. And I really enjoyed my experience. I, I would say that, uh, just kind of off Eve's point about how we, how we created the music, I think a good musical film director should come to a project very open and not, not with strict parameters of how it should be. And you need a person who's normally an actor to guide you through that. And in once it was definitely Glenn Hansard, who I listened to a lot and took a lot from. In a film I made called Begin Again, it was Adam Levine, who was a great singer and a great... And Joe is definitely in this movie the guy that I took guidance from in terms of finding what the movie... I know he's pr feigning surprise here. <laughs> but actually, you, you have to, you should. A good film director, particularly with music, I think, has to cast the film and then look at it. And Joe described this movie back to me perfectly. And it's the movie that is in plain sight. I couldn't see. I was too close to it to know what it was. And he restated it to me in the best way possible, which was, uh, if I don't get into too much too much information, Joe told me a great story about singing with his wife and harmonizing. And it was the key to this movie for me because it was, he, he said a great line, which was when you harmonize with your partner, it's the greatest feeling. And it just struck me as the truth, I know, <laughs> of, this of this film and how much, can you imagine how much you would love your partner if you could sing together? in the middle of the biggest, are you fucking bitch, you, you fuck, I want to take you <laughs> on a journey. Oh, come on. It would solve so many problems. And I took it very literally, and, and, and he sort of gave the film the sort of beat up Tom Waits, sort of not perfect style that it needed. Just, you know, apropos of Adam Levine, who's like a perfect, perfect pop singer and a great funk singer. This was a very, very different movie. It was super low budget. We put our own movie in, uh, money into it. And as Eve describes, we sort of arrived in recording studios with like a couple of, you know, voice messages on my phone of melodies and harmonies. And, and, and so I think you, you have to have your, your person who's is the actor. And it was definitely Joe was the kind of, would no, would no offense to Gary Clark, who was really the musical director. He kind of directed it musically in a very cool way. What about you, Joe? What do you learn as someone who is, you know, known for having like a presence as a as a musician and like an art? You're sort of a man of many talents. What was there anything specific to this project that you didn't know how to do, or even like kind of a new style that you learned or developed? I mean, I, that's funny, and thank you, but that's funny because I've never gotten to sing in a movie before. I've done it like on you know, the Tonight Show or whatever, like, but I, I've never, I've always wanted to sing in a movie. My whole life I've wanted to sing in a movie. I love musicals. 
but I hate most musicals, is the thing. <laughs> and, and I love John's musicals. And so when this script arrived in my inbox, I was just over the moon, and I was so excited. And the context I got, though, was he's thinking probably he wants like a musician to play this part. And I'm like, ah, I'm almost a musician. <laughs> and I, I implored John, I was like, I promise you, I will practice every day, I'll do whatever it takes. Like, you won't have to worry about my musicianship. I've been playing my whole life. I've always wanted to do this. Please, 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 please let me be this character. This is so my thing. And, and by the way, and this is, I think, what you're referring to, I said, I think this character shouldn't sing perfectly. This, and this movie shouldn't, like, it should be more Tom Waits and Nina Simone as opposed to, I don't know, uh, Nat King Cole and, and, and Jeff Buckley or something. Like, it, it, there, there should be, like, that rougher, more human thing. And I can give you rougher and more human. <laughs> so uh, so I, I was just so, so happy and grateful that uh, he, he let, let me convince him to do this movie, and it's, it's really a dream come true. I've always wanted to be in a movie musical, and it's my first time. Did you watch a lot of instructional guitar videos on YouTube? <laughs> uh, no, no I did not. <laughs> Man, I, I did, trying to put, there's a sequence at the beginning of the movie, not to give too much away, where Eve goes online and clicks in, you know, learning guitar, which I've done just for fun, and the dudes out there, it's just hilarious. It's like, I'm going to teach. Hey, welcome, you guys. What's up, YouTube? I'm going to teach you how to play the guitar in 12 minutes. <laughs> and the promises and the faults. And, the, and uh, even now, like, the inter at the beginning, YouTube was like there were a few people out there. But now it's so corporate. And it's so much, click on my thing. I'm going to teach you in 12 things. And, and it's all about dollars at the end of the day. There's no guy really like our guy. Our guy's like, hey, you want to learn guitar? Well, come and join me. And we'll there are some. There There's are a couple some. There's a couple out there, but you play one beautifully. But it's well, but, but we had John. To you also play a great. Uh, guitar I know this is your cameo. I loved it. Yeah, there's a little <laughs> bit of a cameo of me in it actually. Yeah, <laughs> I was actually going. I called up all of my friends who are semi-famous. Not that I have about three actually, and I was like, so I'm doing this sequence. Will you put yourself on camera and pretend to be one of these guys on YouTube? And I asked. I asked Glenn. And he tried to do it, but he's too good. <laughs> and then I got a friend of mine, Peter McDonald, who's an actor. He did a hilarious one. But there's a subtle thing about, about te people who... This character, I, I, I could talk about it all day. It's like, he's not the greatest songwriter on earth. As Joe said, it's not a story about a fantastic singer. I, I, it's a story about a guy who's had some knocks and some disappointments. And I love people who are disappointed in life. And I love people who are full of doubt and not full of swagger and confidence. And all these guys and gals online are full of swagger, full of confidence. It's going to change your life. You're going to get to be on the X Factor, and you're going to win an Oscar, or be whatever you want to be. It's just bullshit. Music has so many more purposes. And when Joe's saying that thing about you know harmonizing with the person you love, there's so many. I mean, in Ireland, we use music to like wake dead people. You have a, you have a guy singing for 12 hours over a coffin. We use music. Remember how we used to use music before MTV and everybody sold you on there's only one narrative for music and that's you get to the top and you're Adele. And you're like, no, that's not that's one use and it's cool, but there are so many more uses of the, the person in the village who was the music person to help us cure and heal, to help us grieve, to help us fall in love. That's what music is about. It's not about, you know, being yes. winning winning the voice. Yes. Can I build on that, too, because I really love the point you just made. I think if you go back uh, 10, 15 years, we thought that the Internet was going to be the thing that returned music to a more egalitarian, community-oriented thing that wasn't all just about being Adele and the number one on MTV. Yeah. And then Naively. Silicon Valley fucked that up <laughs> so bad and, and made it all about how many followers you have and how much money they can drive in their advertising model, and it made the whole thing so hierarchical. And it, that's not what the internet was supposed to be. Yeah, and, and uh, auto-tune has a lot to answer for well, as well, because it's too. like suddenly everybody's perfect. But I again, that's one of the things I really like about this story is it shows how actually you can use the internet to do something other than try to be the most famous, most followers person. You can use it to just connect with another person and play guitar together. Uh, it's someone that you probably wouldn't have met otherwise. That that's what the internet should be. Yeah. That's a great segue into, I, you know, I wanted to ask, 
Jack and Eve and Orn about the family dynamic because I think one of the things that is so moving about the film is that this family is really fractured at the beginning of it and music is, it's not in like a saccharine way, but it helps them sort of understand each other. I'm wondering what you all did to prepare for that. That's a very particular kind of chemistry where you have to be believable as members of a family, but you also have to be kind of at each other's throats. Maybe that is just believable as a family period. <laughs> um, well, me and Oren had, what, a few days to get to know each other? Like yeah, three, three, yeah, three maybe for two days. Yeah, but also we just look like mother and son, don't we? <laughs> we do, we do. Um, so we spent so much time on set together, so we really got to know each other and like, I think bonded. I think, I think you like me, right? I think I do. Okay. And then Jack. I think it's weird that I have a 15 year old kid. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't yeah. know, did we do any family bonding? Like, other than l hanging out on set? Not really. Not really. Not really. I mean, look, I was only really on set for three or four days, That's ultimately. True, yeah. Um, but, yeah, we all gelled pretty quickly. And I think for me, like, the thing about the character is, like, as John was saying, the the interesting thing about the movie is it's people who are kind of a bit disappointed and disillusioned with their lives. And that's certainly the case with my character. And I think he's blinded by his ego and, you know, like what he wishes that he had been. And, you know, ultimately it's kind of about acceptance and getting through that ego and getting past it so you can see what things you actually have in your life and appreciate the relationships around you, you know. And I think there's a nice subtle journey in that with the three of our characters, you know, where there's definitely initially um, a lot of tension between Flora and Ian. Um, and you can see how Max is almost a bit of a pawn in the middle of it, you know? He's almost like a device that they use as a foil for one another. But as the story just gently unfolds, these three people kind of come to an acceptance with one another. And it's not perfect, but it is very beautiful, you know? Yeah, and that is mainly supposed to be because of the music. It sort of brings us together and then... It's, you know, what it's supposed to be Ian's thing. Like, you know, he was in a band that supported Snow Patrol, you know, so it's <laughs> kind of a big deal. Um, and then it, you know, it, it happens to sort of like bring some harmony into into the sort of dynamic of the family. And then yeah, we all die in the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, it's, it's a story of a, an Irish family yeah. fighting and screaming at each other all the time. And then the one thing that they can agree on is, the mu you know, that's kind of, Every Irish family, I think, in a way. Like my, my I hope that the Americans aren't scared of us, like they because be. we do do a lot of shouting, and I think I hit you numerous times. <laughs> many, many times. <laughs> um, my but mother it's, bought it's a record player, and she had a record player, and she'd bring it out twice a year. That was how we listened to music when yeah. we were like, literally, it was like it's music time. We didn't have any phones, or you know, we were all kids, and she'd bring it out, and she'd we'd play records, and it was a ceremonious thing that we'd do a couple of times a year, and it was when you put down, you know, all your uh, uh, hatred and anger and listened to music. It's very, very, and it's kind of what's happening a little bit in the, mov in the movie. They can't function as a family until they find that musical bond, which is kind of interesting. Mm. I wanted to ask a little bit about Flora, one thing that strikes me about her in the movie is, you know, she starts out the movie not as a skilled musician, but she has this preternatural sense of what makes a great song. Are there real people like that who like don't? Yeah, have you're this looking at one. <laughs> 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 um, what do you What do you think is be sort of beneath that? Like, what is that instinct? I don't know. I think it's also an Irish thing. Like, we're very naturally good storytellers, and we're naturally quite good musicians you know um it's so a part of our culture so i think the interesting i think what audience will really really like is that obviously joe represents the california guy america and flora represents the irish dublin girl and how different their artistic sensibilities are but how they end up complementing each other so 
Um, I think she just brings a completely different sort of take and a different perspective on music and lyrics um, that's just fresh for him. Um, and I don't know, she's just no, but I, I, I think I think to, to you make a very good point, which is I think you're right to a point, but I think you've pinpointed a good thing about her character, which is she does have a weirdly good innate ear. And you do, Eve, as a person. Thank you. And I think it's, and you said it, uh, I play her a couple of demos of songs before we made the film, and she's like, no, I'm not singing that shit. You've got to write a better lyric. <laughs> and it wasn't, it wasn't an ego thing. It was, I think, probably a lot to do with your family and the music that you're into. You kind of knew when something was real it's a very yeah. specific ear it's a, a, a cutting through the bullshit i think and yeah. flora is absolutely always yeah. cutting through but the you, bullshit but you have that and yeah it's, it helped me actually because because it made me go because basically what i think you were saying was like i i'd rather not sing that can we go and create something that i know i can sing mm. and i can and i think that she does say a couple of times there are some people i know who have no musical background like my brother kieran he's not a player but he's like that's not a good song like, yeah. He's fucking right. Yeah. Or you play him something and it's like, that's not cooked. That's, that lyric isn't good. And you're like, what do you know about lyric writing? You're not a lyri lyricist. And then everybody who I tell, they're like, your brother's right. Yeah. No, my mom has that with actors when she's not a performer in any sense. Um, my phone. And she's coming here today, so no pressure, guys. But um, <laughs> she can always tell when an actor is bullshitting. And she has such good taste. You know, it's like, some people can just like tap into that, and that that's sort of the special thing. What me, uh, among many special things about Flora, but uh, yeah, that kind of I think it's a confidence building thing for her too. She never thought she could do anything. She never thought she could go anywhere in her life or even you know finish school. So for her to be able to bring something to the table that's actually good and successful, I think is a big. Big turning point for her. I wrote down fixer in my notes when I was watching it because that is how clear her sense of what makes a great song is. It's really like, it, I was impressed by it and she's a fictional character, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I don't think I'm giving too much away. I won't give the context, but uh, Joni Mitchell's Clouds has uh, a moment in the film that is sort of really key. Uh, John, I'm wondering if that was always the song that you had in mind for that moment, and if you could talk about, you know, why you chose it and what it means to you. Um, it wasn't always the song that 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 was in that scene. Or I actually had a had nothing a in this movie was always the thing. No, <laughs> it definitely changed uh, as as we went along. But I don't want to give too much away about that scene. But it's definitely. Um, it's a film, the, the film is generally, I realized something in editing, it's generally about watching people listen to music. It's, a, it's, about, it's about setting up an expectation, because there's nothing I find, I don't know if any of you guys agree with this, but there's nothing as fun as playing a piece of music, specifically music, I think, to somebody who hasn't heard it. It's a, there's a joyful thing of being a DJ for a, for a moment to your like, kids or somebody you've met, or, and if you're falling in love, during that period, there's nothing like seeing the expression on somebody's face. And you get to give them a gift of something that you didn't yourself write, obviously. But um, the film is kind of about that in a lot of ways. And that scene that you, that you uh, point out is a very interesting, because it's three or four minutes on somebody's face. And I watch these, <laughs> I don't know if you guys, <laughs> you watch these videos online of people like, watch these guys listen to Steely Dan for the first time. What was that craze about? It's still <laughs> happening. And I think it's the most fucked up thing. Because it's like, why am I watching some kid enjoy something that I know is really good? And what I realized is, it is actually a really good idea. I just don't want to watch it because I don't know the kid who's watching. If I knew the kid, then it would be fun to watch him or her watching, listening to the thing for the first time. So in our movie, I think you get to know the characters. And once you're invested in them, so seeing a woman who hasn't heard of Joni Mitchell, which is, as we all know nowadays all the children in my life who know nothing anymore past 1990. Like, do you know, do you know, uh, t and they tell, kids tell me stuff like, have you heard of Tom Waits, dude? I'm like, shut up. <laughs> Please, you were conceived to Tom Waits music. <laughs> <laughs> so like, there's but, but, but uh, if you know, if you know the person, and at that stage in the movie, the characters are getting to know each other, so holding on Eve's face 
as she listens to this song play for the... Can you imagine... I mean, I would, can you imagine hearing Joni Mitchell for the first time now as an adult? Like, it must be just, uh, like, incredible. And it's an interesting idea. Now that the internet has, like, there's the whole of the 20th century now is on the internet. You can just go from the 20s, from Gershwin music. You can watch Chet Baker. You can jump to Duran Duran. You can go to Taylor Swift. You can go wherever you want. And you can see the whole thing. And there's so much of it is unexplored for young people. It's very exciting, I think. It's a beautiful moment. It was one take. Yeah, Eve came <laughs> up to me. Really? <laughs> it was, actually. Uh, Eve came up to me on the day of that and whispered in my ear and said, can I, we do that scene first? Because I don't, I don't want to do it after a day of acting. Cause, and she, you really delivered a great performance in that scene without actually saying anything, which is interesting. Yeah. Thanks. I know when, to, um, when, to, when I'm going to be good at being emotional. It's usually in the morning. <laughs> Um, I want to make sure that I leave time for audience questions, but I did have one lightning round inspired by the film. One of the funniest moments is when uh, Joe's character sort of gives uh, Eve's character a lot of shit for her favorite song, Beautiful. <laughs> and he describes it as unacceptable. So I would like to know from each of you, what is an acceptable favorite song? What is one that is not embarrassing to you that you could say on the stage? Our Shakira, favorite song? Hips Don't Lie. Check. <laughs> Are you saying um, our favorite song or just anybody's favorite song that's acceptable? Either. Is okay. this kind of like a cringy song that's acceptable? Is that what this is? Yeah, well, like what's one you would defend? Uh, I would defend a lot of Duran Duran tracks. I wouldn't. <laughs> kind of scared to say because like you know john's like john's got op 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 opinions oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, scared. No, I'm just gonna stick with shakira god that's a good question so you're kind of bad songs that you would defend god because this yeah i don't know that's a really i good remember question. a conversation you and i were having on that rooftop that night and we were talking about songs that we listened to when we were young and songs that like i used to like that i learned to play guitar to and i I told her that like a lot of what I learned to play guitar to was Green Day, and she mercilessly made fun of me. <laughs> uh, but I will fucking defend Green Day. God damn it. I like that song, Wake Me Up. No, it's dude. September, it's, it's unacceptable. <laughs> That's not the song I would defend them on. <laughs> I mean, the thing about... The thing about the thing about me is I am a music snob. That's for sure. I ask my wife. I give out to her and beat her up on her taste every day. And she's like, why do you care? So why are you walking and turning off my music and putting Steely Dan on? And I'm like, because it's, it's like, would you have a shit painting hanging up in your house? <laughs> so, and then I felt bad about James Blunt because he's obviously a really funny, nice guy. But I listened to that song, You're Beautiful, for t fucking 10 years in every <laughs> supermarket. It was a long time. But I had to remind myself of how much I hated that song in order to pull the scene off, because I was like, and, and then I would like, in between breaks, I'd like, I, I have to stop beating up James Blunt and <laughs> Phil Collins. They're probably really nice people. But then I was like, no, no, remember. Remember that day when you thought about this scene. Go for it, go in there! And say it's unacceptable. Yeah, Phil Collins gets a lot of abuse too, doesn't he? Or do, you, do you have one? I feel like I'm put on the spot here. I, I don't, I'm not a music snob. You would be, ra you would be rare on this dais for naming it song from like the 21st century <laughs> <laughs> um i like a lot of hosier stuff i'm gonna do, i'm gonna say hosier i think that's a pretty safe answer for me okay yeah. great thank you all do we have any questions out there do we have a mic or should i rush down okay john uh you get word that someone is making the john carney musical who is directing it who is starring in it and who's writing the music the one about me about you like starring Colin Farrell. Starring, okay. <laughs> it's already in production. There you man. go. <laughs> Who's directing and who writes the songs? Oh, that's a great question. Billy Wilder has been brought, up, brought back to life. <laughs> Billy okay. Wilder is directing Colin Farrell and the mu uh, wh What was the third part? <laughs> Who's writing the music? George Gershwin. Of course. <laughs> and I come off very, very well in it. I don't know if, you, if any of you saw Sing Street. I cast them at Ferdia. Ferdia Walsh Pila, who's a gorgeous little kid who looked nothing like me when I was young, uh, but I cast the cutest looking kid to play me. <laughs> so it's got to be Colin. 
Thank you. Hi, Mr. Carney. Hi. Hi. Uh, you said earlier that you love people who are full of doubt. What would you say to the artists and to the writers in the room who are experiencing that right now? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, just give up. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, thanks. <laughs> I was going to say, use it, write about it, but he just went, just give up. Welcome to Ireland. <laughs> This is, this is told by the man who used to walk into my office when I was about 17 years old, right? Nobody knew who the fuck he was. Walked into my room, hey, how you doing? I'm going to sign with CAA. I'm like, who is this kid? The, the belief and confidence that Jack Rayner had. And then you see him pull up in Transformers. Is it Transformers? Everybody back in Ireland was like, you remember that guy Jack Rayner who used to believe he'd be a Hollywood star? Who was that fucking plank? <laughs> and then we went to the cinema and there's like a Mustang pulls up in the desert. The window rolls down and it's like, hey. And it's like, that's the guy. <laughs> How did he do that? <laughs> so doubt, here's what I would say um, in your question of, of, about doubt. So we're taught, and Americans particularly, are taught this bullshit lesson of you know, meritocracy, believe in your dreams, you're going to get there. And it sounds so good, but it's a total lie, and it's invented by advertisers. What we actually are, as artists and humans and anybody, we're, we're a story of the people we meet. And the lucky people that we're fucking fortunate enough to meet along the road of life, who influence us for better and worse sometimes, and who uh, bless us with some great piece of insight or information who hook us up with somebody who connect us to a producer or a, somebody who wrote something and connect and put people together. We, and we need a bit of grit, that's for sure. We need to dream, but everybody dreams. And they don't all come true. They can't all come true because it's nine billion or what, eight billion dreams of people wanting the best of their lives and it's just not gonna happen. So we have to, I think, really let, stop believing in ourselves as individuals because as individuals, we're nothing. We're, we're, we're just a c bunch of dreams, like every individual. What we really are is a society of people, of artists in this room particularly, or whatever art you find yourself in, and we need thousands of people to get anywhere, to tell any stories. This idea of the individual who's cocksure and full of confidence and dreams always making it is not true. And I am incredibly grateful to so many people along the way who I climbed up on, hung on to for a while. They dragged me a lot and spat me out and I fell back and all the way through. Um, and including Sundance, this festival, man. I, without this festival and us getting in years, I'm not, I wouldn't have had a career. And this idea of following dreams. So da I think doubt and, and, and knocks, all the good people that I know are people who are disappointed. They didn't get it quite the way it was supposed to go. And they're the real people and they're the people who describe their stories in an artful, unique way that I think really we can connect with. That's my answer. Sorry. Very, Very well said. Very well said. Here, here. I wish I wrote that down. Someone put that on a t-shirt. Did you pay her we to ask video that question it. so you could say that? <laughs> Did you pay her to ask that question so you could say that? No, it segued into what I'm thinking about a lot, which is this whole idea of follow your dreams, you can go, and these Oscar speeches and Golden Globe speeches about how this just shows you what can happen if a little girl dreams. No, we're all fucking dreaming. <laughs> You should host the Golden Globes next year. Yeah, I'm going to be like, when this film gets nominated, I'm like, fuck you, Globes. <laughs> I'll just play a clip of this. Great. We have one right here down in front. Hi. Um, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but other than the distance, what kind of cultural differences or challenges are present between these two people from very, fairly different parts of the world? Well, like John's answer was like very Irish. So I feel like we're just kind of more no bullshit, kind of straight talking, self-deprecating kind of um, shit talkers. <laughs> and I don't know, Joe, like I feel like, what do you think about your character? Yeah, I mean, y I guess typically you're right. The the USA is founded on this kind of idea of meritocracy, that culture of, yeah, you can, you deserve to be better than everybody. And uh, I, f I find, I don't, I don't want to speak out of turn about Irish culture, but 
there's more of like a, hey, settle down kind of thing. <laughs> and and yeah. that's probably healthy in, in a way, and some balance in between. But I think also the in, in this particular movie, the part of why these characters get along is the California guy I play is more of a straight talking dude. Atypical perhaps for the cliche of what you might think of as Los Angeles. Um, and they, they get along because they're both really kind of direct with each other. So Weirdly, I feel like America would be more optimistic, but I think you, your character is more pessimistic and I kind of bring a little optimism to it and yeah. it, it sort of a r it reverses doesn't it yeah that's true we kind of bring the other out of each other yeah it's it's a perfect pairing <laughs> uh, we have time for one more if there are any remaining otherwise we'll let these guys skate down to their next venue oh. hey team um, you, uh, John, you indicated that maybe this is a, uh, somewhat self-financed or financed independently. Uh, what were some of the benefits and drawbacks of having, um, you know, having to put your own money into it, as you said? Well, I'm broke now. <laughs> <laughs> Unless somebody buys this movie, I have nothing. Like, I, I, I stopped making films after Sing Street and made TV and bought a house. And from this, I'll buy a chair to put in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized this morning I might get some furniture. <laughs> um... I mean, I, I, I exaggerate it slightly. This is somewhere in between the two. It's, it's an definitely an independent film. It was like, should I... It, was, it felt weirdly, if we put our own money, and as Eve said, if we got like Eve and Joe to help us with the lyrics, we'd own it more. And we'd feel like it was back to the spirit of filmmaking that we all love, and Jack included. We love the kind of storytelling you see at Sundance and the more independent filmmaking approach. And it's definitely just a control thing. You get to control... And we had unbelievable producers on this film, which, you know, is a, a gift because you're, 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 there, there's less control, but there's actually more communication going on between the directors and the stars and the producers if there's less at stake. There's you're less to lose if it all goes crazy, and you know. Um, and I just love working in that in that space. And filmmaking is a uniquely, I think, as an art form, it's the one. It's the one thing that you do need a bit of money, but you don't need too much, and you also need to cut your cloth very carefully. Um, but I find the less money that there is, the more invested you are. And also, as filmmakers, the biggest thing that I think we love, actually, is being told, no, we can't do this, figure out another way into the building. You know, you can't just burst in through the door like Spielberg or like a, a massively financed movie maker. We can't, we have to find ways into this story we have to do cool things with cameras that you wouldn't think of if you had all the money in the world. And I'm not saying that finance movie makers don't have problems and choices and questions as well. Of course they do. But I just really wanted to go back to the drawing board on this way, throw our own money into it and feel like I'm working out here for my kids at home now and, you know, uh, I have to make this film work now a little bit or something like that. It was genuinely one of my favourite movie-making kind of experiences just because... I've done so much TV and this was like an actual creative experience, which I know is like the worst phrase, but um, like when they did the scheduling, I was texting John like, oh, I need the schedule. I have to write my lines, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, don't worry. Like the first week, it's like pretty easy stuff. You know, we're just going to, we're going to warm up into it. And I was like, what? <laughs> the fact that someone would actually think like that and be able to make their schedule so that it was about finding the character and finding the performance and getting to know each other as a crew. And so we weren't putting heavy stuff at the beginning. I was like, what the fuck have I been doing in TV? Like, <laughs> this is insane. Um, and all of that, like with us going into the studio and it just feeling like this small group, this family thing in the summer in Dublin, it couldn't have been a, m a better environment for us to kind of shine, I guess, and really invest in, in the story. And I am sad that I don't have those experiences more often. Um, so... Well, I'm about to offer you another movie. Yeah, oh, great. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but here, I would say just one thing to add, like from what that you're saying as filmmakers, because th we're at a festival... The, and the schedule thing is so interesting. You can so easily, as filmmakers and actors and the whole crew, you can get obsessed by the, the, you know, the script and the schedule and the pickup times. 
And they can sometimes appear like the work, but you have to remember. So the work is lines of dialogue re re read or made up by, like if, act if an actor is making up lines on set, you're still writing together. You're just writing with the actor. But you don't need a script and you, don't need you actually don't need a schedule. All anybody's ever going to see of anything, and the great filmmakers know this, the great filmmakers see the frame and they know that nobody is going to see any of the tracks or the shit or the money. None of that's going to matter. They're just going to go to see a cinema, in uh, to a film, anywhere in the country. It'll do the same thing and you'll just see those, that frame. They're not interested in scheduling or how you got to work or did the, were the producers happy? Was the line produced? Did you make your day? Did you go over or under budget? None of it matters. All that matters is what's between those four corners of the screen in a year's time. That's all anybody is going to see. And how you get there, it doesn't matter to fuck how you get there. It's just as long as you get there, you know, in, in, in the end. That's, the, that's my little message as, as a filmmaker. That's what I've discovered anyway. That's such a great... No, to end on really inspiring. Thank it's you. Like, please get out of here. <laughs> no. All the, all the producers in the room are like, fuck that guy. <laughs> That's so, it's such an inspiring thing to hear someone, especially at a festival like Sundance, say that fundamentally the art matters. Oh, yeah. So I Probably. really want to congratulate you all on a lovely film and what a fabulous conversation. Um, can I get a huge round of applause for these folks? Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>